Hi again, Year 10. Today we're going to analyse London. So if you turn to page 6 in your anthologies, uh, but just make sure you've got your afternoon's notes with you because we're going to analyse London um, by comparing it to afternoons, which obviously we looked at last week. Um, so the reason we're analysing London by comparing it to afternoons is because um, the comparison section of this exam, which is worth um, 25 marks out of 40 for the whole section and um, tends to is is has been for the last three years the, the sort of poorest answered question um out of the whole of literature so it doesn't make sense i think to spend all of our time analyzing these problems independently and then trying to squeeze in all the comparison stuff near the end i'm going to embed the comparison as we as we learn the poems so that that means that you should naturally be starting to draw these comparisons from day one and you should be far more comfortable formulating your comparison essays and um, obviously we've already looked at some comparison work with unseen and you can bring all those skills over and um, there's no difference it's just well sorry there is one difference and that is that obviously in the anthology you also need to compare context so <clears throat> Don't worry that, oh, I've been comparing it to afternoons, I'm going to miss parts of London. That's not the case at all. Um, your London annotations will still be super thorough. Um, and we are going to look at, diff you know, we're going to look at comparing London to another poem as well. So there's loads of scope to look at different themes and, and look at different avenues and different ways to compare. I am not saying that you must compare afternoons to London in your exam. This is just the starting point of it. Um, so. Um, I know I did say last time that I would say that every poem was my favourite poem, but London is also one of my favourite poems. Um, and that's kind of, you know, they're a good pair to start with. Um, it is a dystopian poem. i put that there in case you wanted to know how to spell it. Um, so dystopian, basically, like we've talked about through Dickens, etc. Um, a society that's, you know, unsuit unsuitable for, for, for people to be happy in. Somewhere that's a really sort of bleak place and the feeling that things can't get any better. Um, and it does kind of, um, the poem does portray London in the late 18th century as a dystopian place. Um, partly it's fantastic because dystopians, when it's not happening to you in real life, are fantastic. And it, in terms of a genre, I think it's always, they always teach us something about our society and they always teach us something about what matters. Um, and I think sometimes they can make us feel grateful as well. Um, so I do think London does put into pers to perspective quite nicely um, that the pe or I hope you feel the same that after last week's very pessimistic poem by Larkin we actually might feel by the end of this lesson that you know those women haven't got it that bad in comparison to you know a couple of hundreds of years ago <coughs> my cop's still here uh, okay so we're going to read through London first of all um, and I do think it's important you listen in terms of the style and the sort of tone of the poem it's got a really lovely flow and atmosphere um, and it does feel like a nursery rhyme and then like we did last week we'll go through the title so I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered tends to flow a mark in every face I meet mark of weakness marks of woe in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mine forged monocles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most, through midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. OK, I do think um, it's worth you pausing the video and reading for it again. Obviously, some of the languages will be unfamiliar to you because it is from the late 18th century. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, but do read through it again um, if you want to pause the video now. So let's look at the title. So London obviously says what it you know, does what it says in the tin. Um, but it does set up specifically that Blake is focused on place rather than afternoons which was focused on a period of time um and you know afternoons we talked about sort of the vagueness of it that sense of repetitiveness here blake is focused very specifically obviously on the capital city um there's also the idea that um uh, which i'll come to in a second for context that blake was a bit of an outsider in his society and there's the feeling that kind of 
as a commentator on London, he he was he could be more objective. Like he was on the outsides of it a little bit, and he wasn't kind of trapped in the way that the other people in this society were. Um, but we'll develop that a little bit more as we go through our analysis. Okay, as you can see by the number of arrows, which I've purposely left on, uh, there are a lot of vocab that I just want to clarify. Sorry, there is a lot of vocab that I just want to clarify for you before we start analysing. Obviously, this is going to take up a lot of place, space in your anthology. Um, I have put a link underneath the video where you can go and find a copy of the poem. I've also uploaded a copy of the anthology to show my homework. So if you'd rather do these definitions on a different piece of paper or on a separate, annotate, a separate poem, then that's fine. So starting with chartered. Um, chartered just means that it, it's owned, it, it's sort of controlled and managed. So in this first in this first um, stanza, we've got the bird repeated twice. The street is chartered and even the river is chartered. So there's the idea that it's, you know, that nothing is free, nothing is belongs to the world anymore. It's all been controlled and managed by obviously the institutions, the establishment. And remember that in 1794, the Thames would have been, you know, now we now we picture it as a sort of Sorry, just, just in case you don't know, Thames Main River running through London. Um, hopefully you do know that. Um, if you know now when you go down to London, if you've been or you know just seen it on pictures, it, it's very touristy, it's very pretty, it's very attractive. There's barges, you can go on riverboat tours, etc. Um, back in back in the day, it would have been filled with ships and traders and merchants and businessmen and shipping companies, and every part of the Thames would have been owned and controlled by somebody and using it for money. So there's this focus at the beginning of the idea that, you know, the urban landscape is very controlled and managed and it's all about exploiting it for money. And you can think whether that's still the case today and decide for yourself. <coughs> um, woe just means sorrow. So that idea that the people, everybody he sees is marked on their faces with, with sorrow and misery. Um, the word ban um, basically, it, it's it's kind of almost like a slang term from the period, really. It kind of means to curse or to swear. So, you know, everything this man hears, I'm assuming it's a man, walking around London. Um, I don't really want to assume it's a man, I'm sorry. I'm just... I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that as my pronoun. Um, so, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every curse, in every swear. So, it's the idea that, you know, every sound these people are making and a lot of what they're making it is cursing, is swearing because they're so unfortunate, they're so downtrodden, you know, society and the, this place is not being kind to them. Um, manacles are chains worn by prisoners, so either sort of around the ankles, if, if you've seen all the twists and magwitch at the start, um, or you know, obviously around the wrists to keep them, um, you know, obviously imprisoned. So here, Blake uses the phrase as a, sorry, the word as a, a metaphor to suggest that these, these chains are forged in people's minds. So the people themselves are imprisoned within their own heads. And if that's the case, if you're imprisoned in your own head, then how are you ever going to break free of that? If, as in, if you're not aware that you, you, you're entrapped in the first place. Now, this, these top two lines are a little bit tricky. And I, just because, you know, the, our grammar systems changed slightly since Blake wrote the poem. But essentially what Blake's saying here is that the chimney sweepers cry. And if you remember, chimney sweepers are young boys who are forced to go up chimneys just because they could fit um, to clear the chimneys for the fireplaces for the wealthy. Um, they might get stuck there. They might. Um, eat, and even if they don't, they're constantly breathing in really bad sooty air all the time. So they probably get sick very easily and maybe even die quite young. Um, so, you know, they cry because their life is awful and this is their childhood being stripped away from them. It's, it's appalling the church, which is blackening under this you know, under the fact that it's so poorly meeting its purpose in life. So in this context, a poll means to shame the church, really. It's not a literal translation, but that's essentially what Blake's saying, that the church should be ashamed of itself. And the church is shamed by the fact that this is happening to people in their community. Um, and remember, you know, 1794, the, the church 
played a much bigger role in kind of community outreach and looking after its citizens. Um, hapless means an unfortunate, so the unfortunate soldier. Um, Back in Blake's time, the soldiers would be more likely to die from disease on camp than from actually fighting on a battlefield. Like they weren't very well fed or looked after. Um, you know, disease would run right through the camp, so they certainly weren't treated well and revered in the way that they are today. Um, or hopefully people do revere them today. Um, so you know, it, it really was a thankless job, and of course, soldiers were supposed to fight for the king at the time and the country. Um, which is why in the next line Blake attributes it to the palace's fault. Finally, uh, last stanza, we've got harlots, which is a relatively nicer word potentially for prostitute. Um, youthful obviously highlights how young they are. Um, harlots and chimney sweeper kind of go together. Um, the girls were forced into prostitution, whereas boys were forced into the chimneys. Um, to blight something is to damage or to spoil it. And the hearse, obviously now we'd, we'd call that car for funerals, but um, back in Blake's time, it would have been a cart for funerals. So obviously pause on this, get your head around all the vocabulary because it'll be hard for you to get into the deeper meanings of the poem if you've not um, done that. Okay, so moving on to context. Um, so William Blake as a poet, I'm just going to focus on um, the body of work that this was published in because I do think it has a lot of bearing on the meanings of the poem. So he published this poem in a book called Songs of Innocence and Experience and as you might imagine the first section, Songs of Innocence, um, explored childhood and, and you know the innocence that comes with childhood but also sometimes the powerlessness that comes from childhood. Um, I've put a link again in the description of, with, to Spark Notes where you can get further information about this. But remember, you don't need to go overboard. Um, you've only got a little amount of time in your exam and I am giving you what you need here. Um, the experience section then looks at life through the lens of adulthood, kind of detailing the corruption, repression, the restrictions that obviously um, that often come with this period of our lives. I'm hoping you can start to see here where um, afternoons and the comparisons to afternoons can come in quite nicely. So this poem is taken from the experience section. It's very about exposing, um, you know, the, the, the negative side of, of, of adulthood. Um, he very much uses tones and structures we associate with nursery rhymes, as I've already said, um, and we will come back to that later, in, well, in just a second. And hopefully you could hear that when I read the poem out. And Blake presents these poems, um, including London, uh, as an outsider. Like it's very frequent in the poems that he's using sort of somebody else, a speaker. He doesn't write as himself. Um, and often that speaker is on the outside of what, what they're describing. Now, I did I differed about putting this one in because I don't really like, as you know, biographical contextual information isn't really always very useful. But I do think there's a case here um, that as somebody who he was homeschooled and lived on the outside of society in London, that, you know, he was well placed to, as I said, when I was analysing the title, to really kind of see it for what it is. And it's interesting because Larkin was very similar, but as we'll see when we're analysing it, they both tend to focus on different things. Certainly Blake's speaker is far more empathetic to the people that he's describing. Um, so I guess why I'm including this is because, you know, you could argue that it does give him a better insight into the conditions and it does link back to the idea that he's well placed. You know, this was hundreds of years ago and we could discredit it in, in you know, as, as being a, a sort of historical record because it's, you know, it's not factual. It's not it's not a, a written official law documentation but actually this is a man who was well placed to see London at the time for what it is and I do think it lends an authenticity to the poem. Okay so the world the text was produced in I've already said it was first published in 1794 and your key thing really is the fact that this is the industrial revolution obviously it started about what um, 20 to 30 years earlier um, you know we're in the throngs of it at the time and, and this is your key thing really in a way especially as a, as a historical document if you look at the poem in that in that fashion actually that is what um, we, we get an insight into the impact of the industrial revolution and what it was like to live through it 
Um, you might want to compare it to the technological revolution we're living in now, um, and you know which one has, has been easier or less impactful or more impactful. So one of the things that you need to consider about the industrial revolution is the the actual literal physical journey that people took. So the urbanization element of it, people were moving from rural communities into these urbanized cities which were dirty and poorly organized because of the pace of the industrial revolution so it was very difficult for authorities to keep up and, and kind of plan for this mass immigration that was happening at the time we also had industry journey so in terms of you know people who worked in rural community job farm jobs would literally work for a family they might become friends with that family they might develop a relationship with all the other people working on the farm you know they'd live in the same village or nearby at least whereas in the in the city in london you then go into this massive factory you might never even meet your boss um the person who's paying your wages it was relatively sort of very cold and and sort of you know it, you weren't part of a community anymore you were just a cog in a machine and therefore this sense of an emotional journey that people would have gone on at the time that sort of isolation they might have felt in this big city the loss of community the loneliness that they might have felt um which helps the workers the the bosses to exploit the workers because there's no sense of togetherness or people fighting for each other um you know everybody needed the job uh, i was trying to think of an equivalent of um what you might have experienced i suppose maybe primary school to secondary school in terms of that step up of you know spending all day with the same people in the same class then having to meet loads of different people and maybe going into a, a, a class you have once a week and thinking does this teacher even know my name um and even you'll you'll experience that again when you go to university where you go from obviously the way things are at secondary i hope now you know that all your teachers know your names um and you know you know everybody now when you step up to university you don't get anywhere near that one-to-one -one support you are facing a lecture hall of maybe three three hundred students um you very rarely will develop the same relationship with a lecturer that you have with your teachers at high school so you've got that fun part to come as well um <laughs> but obviously you know your, your halls and, and making friends outside of your course will help to counter that please don't feel like it's going to be miserable it's quite fun um but you know and just trying to think of ways to help you relate to that idea of, of that kind of loneliness i mean we've we've done dickens we've done christmas carol we know how the city could make people feel and um, so just keep that in mind when you're analyzing this poem as well okay so moving on to the bigger picture um, narrative choices now I think this is the only time I will ever analyze rhyme with you because I don't <laughs> you know what I'm like about structure and, and um, rhyme and sounds this I think is a really good example of where it's really relevant in helping to create meanings so if you remember from last year um, we label uh, we label the lines of rhymes with the same sorry we label the lines with the same letter if they rhyme and then if they start a new rhyme then we use the next letter so you can see here that consistently all the way through the poem we've got um alternative um lines that are rhyming so a b a b c d c d uh the c in brackets turned into copyright symbol i really liked it so i left it in. um there's there's no other reason so the key thing to say about the rhyme scheme it is a regular a b a b and we you don't need to call it that you can just call it that you know you can just say that blake uses alternate rhyming couplets um, so street meet, flow woe, man van fear here, all the way through. Now, um, what we then have then is this really interesting juxtaposition between the sound of the poem, which is so jaunty and feels like a nursery rhyme, and feels like that innocence of the first section of of his of his book of his po sorry his book of work, the songs of innocence, and just contrasts so darkly with the themes which are so horrible and repressive and you know you're talking about misery and death and this horrible cycle of life which we'll come on to in a minute so you it's just a really interesting juxtaposition and i think it actually really pays it, it gives credit to what poetry was for originally now remember this is a couple of hundred years ago and you know we don't often hear poetry now it's something that we you know we buy a collection of poetry maybe and we read it at home to ourselves unless we go to a poetry night to see it performed the only time we really listen to poems now is in song lyrics um which 
you know, for, for people who do listen to music regularly, that is a massive part of what makes music beautiful, isn't it? The, sat, the lyrics and hearing them spoken aloud and what their meanings are. Um, and I think that Blake here is really paying homage to that origins of poetry that would have still been more prevalent in, you know, two, three, 200 years ago, where he's kind of thinking about, you know, the sound of the poem is inviting. It makes people feel like, oh, it's a pleasant poem. It's enjoyable. And then actually, once he's grabbed you with that, he's then protesting against this society and, he, and you know, he's drawing you in so he can give you a very strong political message. And it's very similar to Dickens. Remember, we talked about the fact that Dickens entertains first so that he can preach second. So he gets you in with a fun story, uh, Chris, uh, you know, a Christmas story, ghosts, and then he delivers his social message. Blake is doing the same here. And I think that's why the rhyme scheme here works so effectively. And just don't forget to link it back to that contextual idea um, that, he, you know, this nurse rhyme feel was common in all of Blake's work, especially in this book. And it brings together the innocence with the experience. OK, other sort of big picture choices that we talked about, I've kind of use a similar format to what we did with afternoons so it's written in the first person present tense which gives us a direct live feeling of of this man wandering around london um you know it's more powerful and um the present tense element of that is also used by larkin and we talked about that for larkin too however he does use the third person larkin so there's a sense that he's more detached and again we'll talk about that later um, in both poems, the speaker is an outsider. So um, in London, we've got I wonder and I mark. And it feels like he's sort of observing London. Um, but again, Blake is more personal, hence the first person. As in afternoons as well, there's a lack of individuality throughout the poem. We don't have a named mother. We don't have a named man. It's mothers, men. And here again, we've got the chimney sweeper, the harlot, the soldier. So people are defined almost in both poems, actually, by their roles to society and, you know, what they have to do to contribute rather than any sense of personalisation. Um, they're looked at in terms of almost like a commodity, like what can they offer society? Um, the definite article, the, remember, we always label the, or we can always label the, the definite article. Um, you know, they're all the same, they're indistinguishable the prostitute the soldier well there's there's hundreds of soldiers they can't all just be clumped into that one label um so it's that idea that you know they're all that's all they are just that title um if you compare it to the ah as in the indefinite article so a soldier you know that makes them feel more of a specific example both poets don't want to do that they want these people to be seen as indistinguishable they're just part of a bigger group OK, um, I am going to go through each stanza in quite a lot of detail here, because um, obviously when we come to the analysis section, we're going to be looking at comparisons. So I do want to make sure that you fully understand what Blake is saying in each stanza before we dive in. If you you don't necessarily have to make notes on this, it's whether you feel you need to to help you with revision. And, um, you know, if you can just listen and take it in and then think, right, I've got the poem and you'll remember that, then there's no need to write this down as notes. So in stanza one, he very much focuses on the visual, what, what the speaker can see. Just going to pause for some water. <coughs> Sorry, the um, system that I'm using to record doesn't let me pause. It's a bit prehistoric um, and I don't want to stop it because I'll have to create a new um, separate video. All right, so uh, the speaker wonders with relative freedom to everybody else, and he is seeing how miserable people are in London. It marks of weakness, marks of what. And London at the time is so heavily regulated and controlled, which is clear by that rep rep sorry, repetition of the word chartered. And think about the fact that this would contrast so massively with the rural land that they would have recently lived in. Um, you know, and it's, it's very urban. You've got the street and, and kind of that lack of nature that, that we that we'll we'll talk about next time when we look at nature as a theme um so think as well about in terms of linking this to blake and the fact of him being an outsider as well 
So the misery of these people is so extreme that it appears as a mark on their faces, a mark of weakness, a mark of woe. Um, weakness obviously links more to powerlessness as well. So straight away stanza one, it's very clear how these people are feeling. In stanza two, he moves on to the oral, so sounds, and the speaker can hear the misery of all walks of life as indicated by the fact that he keeps repeating every and he suggests that children are born into fear the infants cry of fear so how are they going to grow up to have a good life or a better life if they're born into these terrible circumstances of you know they're afraid the minute they're born and as we talked about he suggests that the people are trapped by chains manacles which are created in their own minds mind forged this metaphor suggests that people trap themselves and can therefore never be free. Um, I was going to say something about the children. No, it's gone. Sorry. It'll come back. Don't worry. Um, okay. So, stanza three, the anger. The narrator disappears here and it really becomes more of a protest poem. So, the speaker clearly blames the institutions which should help people. He blames the church because children who should be protected by them are forced to work in horrible conditions. He blames the palace and royalty because of the soldiers who fight in the name and they're again in terrible conditions. Um, and it is very, very much that Blake is very clearly protesting these institutions. You, if you read this poem at, at that time period, you couldn't help but feel kind of anger towards them. Or, or if you were part of that system, at least offensive about what you're doing. Um, you know, he he's doesn't pull any punches. It's very clear here what he's saying. Similar to the way Dickens builds that up throughout his work as well. We are going to talk about the fact that Larkin maybe doesn't do this. And we'll come back to that later. So in the final stanza, um, the narrator returns again. And we can see that through the phrase, I hear. Uh, but most through midnight harlot. Oh, I can't remember off my head, sorry. And it says I hear at the end of the first stanza anyway. Um, and he says that, you know, this is the worst thing I hear. Um, so the speaker in this stanza is highlighting the cyclical nature of this misery. It is going to go on and on. And you can look back across history if you want to about the impact of poverty and corruption in our institutions and decide for yourself whether this is still the case. So in this stanza we have young girls being forced into prostitution as we talked about they're the harlots um where they will get pregnant obviously you know remember we wouldn't have had contraception in those days and they would have been able to support or look after their child so then not only is the bond broken with their child because they can't mother them properly because either they're going out to work they they can't feed the child they would have felt very frustrated it's very young as well not you know think of the support systems in place that we expect and, and mothers deserve now and that just wouldn't have been there at all um, and obviously the child then is born into poverty as well so even that itself is is a terrible cycle um, and it links nicely back to stanza two where the child is you know scared from the moment that he's born remember our Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know it wasn't wi by the bottom it was that sense of safety and, and food etc these children were not being born into that and the other idea that Blake um, indicates here about sort of broken down society relationships and this idea of it being a cycle is this idea that obviously these women who are forced into prostitution, it, it really kills their chance of love, like their chance of marriage. And that's kind of embodied in this, this oxymoron marriage hearse, you know, love and death are what we associate with those two words. So the death of love and that also on a kind of more literal level. The spread of STDs, so you know, blights with plagues. These men who sleep with these women will get infected and take those infections back to their wife, wives, or you know, anyone else. Um, they too will also be infected. You know, they spread the, this plague, these diseases amongst this underbelly of society, but it's not their fault. Um, but it, and again, it links this idea of you know, um, it being a widespread issue and it being unstoppable, really. Um, I'm very cautious of what, of the, what I'm saying here and how these words are being used in the news at the minute. Um, and all of society is broken down. Yeah, this isn't just, these are all massive relationships. These are wealthy people are infected, poor people are infected. 
and it will just keep going. So it ends on a very, very bleak note. And you might find that by comparing it to Afternoons, you do feel like Afternoons is a relatively joyful poem, which I'm sure you wouldn't have thought of last week. OK, so in terms of potential themes um, this week, because um, we're already on 30 minutes, so uh, we're definitely only going to look at one theme today. Um, I'm going to show you kind of how to work out for yourself what you would like you know, which poem you'd like to use for which theme, depending on what comes up. Um, but remember, we are focused on comparing to afternoons, so we are kind of going to primarily be looking at the themes we've already identified for afternoons. So first, for the rest of today's lesson, we're going to look at people and places, which is the second theme we looked at for afternoons. OK, so let's just recall what we said for this theme for afternoons. And this is just a summary. You can go back and read your notes if you want to. Um, so we said that people feel trapped by the place that they live in, both physically in terms of trees bordering and metaphorically by the roles they have to play in society. Men stand, mothers assemble. We said there's a sense that um, the place wasn't built for mothers, that new recreation ground. It was built for the children, that the women are excluded from places uh, and positions. They're being pushed to the side. And we said that adulthood is clearly defined for us and it strips us of all of our youthful ideas such as love and romance. And that can be seen by the fact that the wedding album is lying near the television and the estate full of washing. That's not exactly what you promise when you are stood at the altar making your vows. I can't wait to wash all of your clothes. OK, so let's look at the first stanza then in terms of people and places and comparing it to those ideas and afternoons <coughs> excuse me so we've got trees bordering in afternoons and the idea of you know the place in trapping the women i think you can link and cross-reference really nicely to the idea of chartered in london um you know that it's managed that it's controlled that the place itself lends itself to a lack of freedom and that's kind of the key message that's put across by both poets. Um, the fact that Chartered is re re sorry, repeated here does suggest that there is more constraint in London than in afternoons. Um, you know, you can evaluate that if you want to and debate it. Um, but certainly, you know, there's a feeling here that everything is owned and everything is controlled, even the river, um, which, you know, you would expect to be able to flow freely. The rivers are very powerful forces. I mean, geographers amongst you, as we know, there's a lot, will obviously think about how often men have tried to control rivers and river management systems, etc. So maybe you might want to argue with me fully on that one. OK, so what I'd like us to do is whenever we're kind of making a comparative point, I do want you to return back to the previous poem, because obviously you remember we talked about illuminating comparisons and how when you compare one poem to another, you should see fresh ideas in the first poem. So you know, Larkin doesn't state, this is just one thing you can consider, Larkin doesn't state that the family live on chartered land, he doesn't sort of think about that in terms of, you know, that's just not his priority, but actually if you think about it, do they? Like, is the park chartered? Is the home chartered? Is the street chartered? Quite possibly, and quite probably, yeah, if, if those if that if one of those women wanted to go into the front garden and put up a massive monstrosity, the council would have every right to come along and say, no, you can't do that. Um, Neighbours could complain. So even though it's not present in Larkin's poem, that, you know, it, it could be. So he's chosen to exclude that. And you can think about why. And um, for these boxes that are always going to be in blue, don't feel constrained by what I'm prompting you to think about. There are multiple things you could go away and think about. And this is where your perceptive band five skills are going to come in. Take the time to just ask yourself, how do I see this poem differently now in relation to London? How has it made me see it differently? And that's where you'll get your originality, those marks that will make the examiner step up and stop and think, oh, this is someone who's really thought about this and put their own personal response on it. So. Please don't be limited by the questions I'm asking you. It's just a, a one way of looking at it. Uh, and the same applies to these red boxes where I'm asking you what ideas are generated by this comparison. So this is just one. Um, so, you know, you might ask yourself now, are people just as controlled and trapped in the late 50s 
as they were during the Industrial Revolution, or I should say were people, sorry, you know, and were they more or less aware of it? So you might want to ask yourself whether the women in Larkin's poem are more or less aware of, of this idea of the charted landscape than, than the people in, in London are, and or are the people in London completely naive to it, given that they've got these mine forge manifolds? Okay, another thing we can get out of this um, stanza in terms of comparisons for people and places is that in this poem, the speaker sees the people's emotions. And I really do feel that that's absent in afternoons. There is no description of how the mothers feel. The mothers assemble, but how do they feel about that? And, and we can obviously infer it through the word assemble, but you know, here we've got this really clear focus on what the speaker can see. He can see marks of weakness. He can see marks of woe. So mark, the word, is obviously repeated three times here, but it's actually used in two different ways. So the first mark is a verb, to mark in people's faces, to see, to spot in every face. This speaker is really engaging with these people, and it really links to the idea that Blake has chosen to write in a protest poem. And if you're doing a protest poem, you want to create empathy for the people you're protesting on behalf of. So he's got to see them, otherwise it wouldn't be as a very effective protest poem. And then in the next line, Marx is repeated, and um, it, we've got a bit of parallelism here, actually, where it repeats um, like a grammatical structure, Marx of, Marx of. Um, so it uses a noun here. Sorry, that was like perfect English language, A-level head on then, sorry. <laughs> so Marx of weakness. Now, weakness obviously suggests sort of, um, oh, sorry, that's on the next section. But Marx suggests permanence. Yeah, that there is literal scars on the faces of this misery. So he makes the abstract concrete. He takes these abstract emotions that usually, you know, you we wouldn't be able to necessarily see evidence of. And he's suggesting that it's so powerful. These emotions are so deforming that they are literally appearing on these people's faces just as they walk around in London. Um, and it really pins down the impact of the place on the people in a much more vivid way than Larkin does in Afternoons with the women. Um, we've got every to highlight that this is all elements of society and we've got the emotions themselves. So weakness being the lack of power, you know, who has the power, the establishment, the institutions, and then woe, as we've talked about, is misery. I think as well, connotations of woe is a helplessness. Like you can't, you're just full of woe. You can't do anything about it. You can't bring yourself out of it. So um, I do think when you return to afternoons, you might think here about the fact that Larkin doesn't actually state that these women have marks of woe. He states their beauty is thickened. But how do we know they're unhappy? Because we do know they're unhappy. So how does he use language differently to convey that? And then in, in, in which case, you know, could you maybe argue that Larkin's poem is less pessimistic? Because yes, these women are trapped, but they're not deformed from it time has deformed them in terms if you know if that's maybe a harsh word in terms of the beauty being thickened but you know there's an avenue you can go down there thinking about you know are these women as unhappy what different language choices has Larkin made what hasn't he included and why so in terms of ideas generated you know it certainly becomes clearer as I've talked about that Blake's speaker sees the people with more empath empathy Larkin is just narrating what they do. He's just narrating what's happening to them. That That's it. So you might kind of want to think about why does Blake go further? Is it because he's writing a protest poem? What's, you know, what's Larkin's focus if it's not to protest? Okay. Uh, stanza two then. Larkin obviously focuses on mothers, but he does refer to children and husbands as well. Whereas Blake considers a bigger perspective, he considers the wider society and not just the family unit. And you see that specifically as well in stanza three. So um, obviously, again, we've got the repetition of every to highlight how widespread this pain is in every voice, in every infant. No one, not one child is born without being afraid. Not one man does not cry. 
Um, and again, he thinks about both young and old. So remember, man here would be used for all genders as that kind of, you know, gen gender neutral pronoun that would have definitely been used at the time. And we've kind of started to move away from now. Um, you know, these are really, again, like contrasting images, juxtaposing images, especially in 1794, we wouldn't have associated cry with man. We wouldn't have associated fear with infants. It, 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 you know, in terms of it's an unnatural image almost, it should be that infants are soothed and cared for and safe and that man should be able to deal with his experiences. And I'm not talking about this in terms of to toxic masculine ideas. I'm talking about this in terms of as an adult, we are taught that we should be able to manage our affairs and our feelings, which of course is rubbish because we're all just human. But in those at that time period, that would have certainly been the expectation. So, you know, or this feeling, at least, that if society was working for these people, then these emotions would not be felt. And, and that's what's really emphasised by these sort of unnatural images of infants crying out of fear and, and, and adults crying. So, if we turn to afternoons, although Larkin arguably focuses on a smaller section of society, he's looking at the family unit. How does he write the poem to suggest that what he describes is wide reaching? So, you know, the fact that we've got mothers as this generic term and we've got men and we've got skilled trades. All of these generic nouns really help to create the idea that this is a widespread issue. It's not just one family. And if we think about the fact that, you know, families make up a massive, massive um, percentage of our society, you can evaluate this, this con you know, this, this original contrast and idea that Larkin is focused on a smaller unit by instead countering that and saying, well, actually, this unit that he's focused on has massive ramifications for many, many, many people across society. Again, that's just one thing you might look at when you go back to afternoons. Um, ideas generated by the comparison. We've got the idea that the adult and the child's experiences are very separated in both poems. So the children are very free in afternoons in comparison to the adults. They have expectations. They are set free. They go looking for the unripe acorns, whereas the adults assemble, the mothers assemble, they, the men stand. Um, and it's the same here. We've got the man crying and, and the infants, I suppose, are still crying, but very specifically, it's fear that's driving that cry um, and, and still Blake takes the time to distinguish them on those two separate lines, man, infant, adult, child. Um, so, you know, there, there is a sense in both poems that there is a very different experience to be had of the world when we are young versus when we are old and that, you know, there's a great contrast there. Okay, the most important line in the poem and we've already talked quite a lot about it. So, you know, we've talked about the fact that they're, they're so trapped, they're not even conscious of the fact, so how can they free themselves? If we think about that in terms of comparison, it really just contrasts with afternoons where although the women aren't sure what's controlling them, you know, is it time, is it nature, something, you know, that vague word, but they do know that something's pushing them. So they are aware that it's happening, they're aware that they're moving on, that they're losing things. Whereas in London, there's not that sense. There's the sense that they don't know. And um, I've just thought as well about the fact that he can hear the manacles. That's quite interesting. Like this it creates a very literal idea of the sort of chains in their head rattling around um, as they walk past him. Um, I just I think it's a I think it's the most tragic image in the poem, because if you're trapped and you don't know it, you just can't make things better for yourself. Um, and, you know, it does always make me think about different ways you can be trapped. Obviously, this is a very extreme way, but we can be culturally trapped or we can be socially trapped by expectations on us. And, you know, you can still say that the women and afternoons are obviously socially trapped by expectations, as are the men. Um, maybe adults as a whole are. Maybe, maybe we all still trap ourselves by saying, as an adult, you must be this way and you must be this way. And we make ourselves more miserable. Who knows? You can decide. Hopefully you won't feel that way when you are an adult. Um, but I always think about when I went to live in Malaysia and how um, this is like quite this is a minor example. Like I didn't I don't feel like British society had me trapped at all. Um, I mean, I, you know, in some ways it, it, we're all trapped. But, you know, there were things that I realized by living in a different culture 
things that I realised I didn't actually want to do or I didn't actually enjoy, but I did just because my culture that I was raised in told me that that was the right thing to do. Um, so I think there's an element here that, you know, you know, and I wouldn't have known that until I went and lived somewhere else where I kind of, you might say that I then freed myself of those mind forge monocles. I started, monocles, sorry, I started to look at things diff differently. Um, so, you know, that this, this is why I always promote travel, because I think it does make you see the world differently and it does help you to get rid of these mind forge manacles. Um, but I do think here in London, it's used in a very extreme way. Um, how can anything ever get better if they're not even aware? Um, you might think in today's context how, you know, we are we are trapped in certain ways and that we are powerless to say governments or people who are in control of us. And is that right? And and how often do we stop and appreciate that fact or identify that fact? Or are we still unaware? You know, are we still, do we still require someone else to come along and say to us, this is you being trapped in this way? Uh, there's lots of avenues you can go down of thought with this. Uh, but I do think the key thing is that this is the most tragic line. This is the bit where you just feel like these poor, these poor people are going to be trapped forever in this kind of misery that they're helping to create because they can't see a better way of living. They can't see that there's a way out. Okay, so we've talked about manacles being um, prisoners changed, chains and obviously they're metaphorical because they're forged in the mind so they're not literal chains. Um, the people are in prison and prison in themselves. You could argue here that Blake is indicating that the Industrial Revolution was nothing but a prison. That once you entered the city, you were trapped. You couldn't get out of that system. You couldn't return back to rural land where you would get paid less money. People, you know, were driven by the su relative success of it. And, and even that traps you. The fact that, you know, you don't want to lose money. You don't want to lose wages. Um, you can link that to career ladders in, in the modern modern era. Um, sorry, that actually shouldn't be the either. Um, I've copied that over for our website. The E is not present in your anthology. So make sure you don't spell it with the E when you're quoting it. And this I hear, you know, the speaker is em empathetic again. He's paying attention to these people as he walks past them. He can hear metaphorical manacles in their heads. Um, so it's far more personal than Larkin's speaker. Um, definitely, he's really engaging with these people and trying to empathise with them. So if we return to afternoons, um, are the families there more or less trapped than the people of London, you might think about? If time is trapping them, is that easy to accept because it's natural than a place and social structures? I mean, people in both poems are constra constrained by social structures. Um, but certainly this idea of time versus place is quite interesting. Um, you know, does try and trap us all? Can we do anything about that? But, you know, it, maybe we feel like we can definitely do something about a place trapping us. And then ideas generated. Um, you know, in both poems, then, as I've just said, we've got society's expectations as, as trapping us in. Maybe not even society's expectations in London. It's more sort of, you know, constraints of society is, are trapping the people within it. Um, and that's definitely enforced by comparing these poems, by putting them one next to the other. It is a common theme. It's a common problem. All right. So on to the third stanza. Um, just before I get into it, the, I just want you to take note of the capital C's and the S's and the P. So we've got um, common nouns here. So, sort of, you know, we have a lot of palaces, we have a lot of soldiers, we have a lot of churches, we have a lot of chimney sweepers. Uh, but they're given capital letters as if they're proper nouns, as if they are distinct, as if they are more important, as if they are, you know, there's only one of them. So we're seeing the chimney sweeper here, not as a group of boys, but as a title, as a role in society. The church and the palace are given more authority through that capital letter. The soldier, same as the chimney sweeper, is seen as a specific title. Um, and again, given more power, you know, it's interesting actually that he gives the same status to the chimney sweepers and the church, as if to say they are equal and they should be treating the chimney sweepers on their level instead of seeing them as, as subordinates or people who aren't you know on equal to them so uh, that's just a side note i've got i've not written that down so if you want to pause and add that on now you can 
so this stanza builds on the idea that Blake considers wider social institutions rather than the family unit. Um, Larkin does not blame anybody, really. Um, whereas Blake blames the church, the army, the monarchy. He blames the institutions which should protect people and don't. So this builds really nicely on previous choices that both writers have made. The fact that um, Blake has more empathy for the people, whereas Larkin's just observing. Well, of course, that's the, and, 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 you know, Blake's is a protest poem. So, of course, he's got to think about blame. Larkin isn't blaming anyone. He's not really interested in that. And I think this really makes that clear. Um, that there's an absence of that in Larkin's poem that actually when you think about it now you might expect to see. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a second. So in terms of um, breaking down the language in this stanza we've got obviously the young boys forced to work up chimneys which we've, we've talked about already you should have already written down. Um, so their tears, their cry is shaming the church who should be protecting them. So blackening suggest, as an adjective suggests sin and corruption of something that should be pure. Now, interesting, the same thing is happening to these children who are chimney sweepers. This pure, innocent childhood is being corrupted and they are also literally being blackened when they go up the chimneys. So the language here subtly brings together the chimney sweepers in the church and it suggests that, you know, the experiences of the ch these chimney sweepers, which is a blackening of their childhood and their souls and their innocence, is also blackening the church. So. Blake's message here is, if you let these people suffer, you are doing the same damage to your own institution and you need to sort it out. Uh, maybe not as, um, it's not been as uh, direct as maybe uh, Wilfred Owen was in Dulce at the if you want to kind of look back over that, where he does literally speak to the governments who are sending their children ardent for desperate glory. Um, so you've got, you know, a it's less direct, but it's still very, very invective, still very protesty, still very clear on who he's blaming. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, obviously, we've already talked about soldiers fight for king at the time and country. And you've got this metaphor of the soldier's sigh runs in blood down Paris walls. Um, now, it doesn't mean literally runs like a human being would run. It just means trickles down. So that's why it's not personification. Um, and again, puts the blame clearly with the royals. And again, same link soldiers go out and bleed for their country well that blood is infecting your palace that we expect to see as a beautiful place that should be ornate and wonderful and a symbol of how opulent and and, and rich and wealthy you know our country can be as a world leader etc it's been tarnished with this blood that blood will not you know there are not there are consequences for what you're doing to these soldiers you are being infected same as the church is being blackened Okay, so if we return to afternoons, I think it's really important at this stage that you do ask yourself, well, it's very clear in London where the blame is at, or who's to blame. In afternoons, it's not. So ask yourself, who is to blame for these gender roles and these restrictions that we put on adults? And, and why isn't Larkin exploring this blame? Why does that not matter to him? Or, you know, what is he ignoring? What does he want us to focus on instead? That's a nice avenue of exploration for your kind of perceptive points. And then ideas generated by the comparison, it really is this, like that Blake's poem is far more of a protest, whereas Larkin's is just simply stating the way things are. And I think that this is a this is an idea that's generated by putting these poems next to each other and something that's become gradually more obvious as we've gone through the analysis. You know, it keeps coming up, doesn't it, as a kind of reason or a difference between the two poems. And this is something you might not see straight away. And I want you to see this as an example of how close study of the poems and really digging deep into both of them can really help you to see different things and, and generate new formulate, uh, sorry, formulate new lines of argument for your comparisons. Like that could be a line of argument in an essay. As long as it was linked to the theme. OK, uh, last stanza then. Um, perhaps probably the most pessimistic stanza in the whole poem. Um, so again, Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Similarly to afternoons, there's a sense that people remain trapped in this cycle. Um, 
which builds on the idea of Marion Forge manacles. So in afternoons, we've got Lee's Fall, Summer is Fading, and they can be cross-referenced to Marriage Hearse, you know, Death of Love, this cycle. Um, and here, Blake is also more focused on familiar relationships, so family and how it's torn apart by society. So you could argue it's more of the focus that Larkin um, offers as well. Although, again, Blake still puts it in context of a wider societal problem. So um, the word most really distinguishes that this observation from the speaker is the most damning. And obviously it's midnight because that's when prostitutes would work. So in the midnight streets and it's through the streets as if, you know, this is a repetitive sound. It's 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 not just one woman on a corner. It's it's multiple women. And he can hear, um, you know, the youthful harlots curse. So the youthful obviously highlights that these are just young girls. They've lost their innocence. So you can link these to the chimney sweeps and the blackening of the church. Now, curse has got a nice double meaning. Obviously, it it's their own curses that they are cursing their life they are unhappy they are miserable so their feelings towards their life but also the curse could literally be their life like they are cursed into prostitution and there are you know there's a sort of religious connotation there of a curse the idea of you being damned um by god or whoever or by the devil you know by you know, living this cursed life, you've done something wrong. And of course, these girls have not done anything wrong. Society has done something wrong. The church has done something wrong. The palace has done something wrong. The leaders have. Um, and then those harlots obviously can't look after their children. Now, this is the second time that we've had infants crying in the poem. And I think that you, you know, you can contrast with Larkin's description of children with the more traditional innocent and free um, childhood that you would expect to see. So actually you might argue, um, so I'm just thinking this now, so it's not written down. You might argue that by looking at London, it really makes you, whereas in afternoons you might resent the children because of what they take from the adults, what they take from the mothers. When you read this poem, you think, oh, thank God they've had that beautiful childhood. And of course that's worth the mothers giving that, you know, giving something up so these children can have, so they're not scared and they're not crying and, you know, they're not having this horrible life. Um, so, sorry, that's a, a little side point that I think, you know, when you join the poems together, you do kind of appreciate more the, the joy of the children in afternoons. Um, so there's the idea here that the cycle is continuing. Like we've already said, if the, the prostitute gives birth to a, a baby who's afraid, who's impoverished, they're going to grow up to be prostitutes. They're going to grow up to be chimney sweepers as well. Um, and then in this last line, again, we kind of already spoke about this in quite a lot of detail, the widespread impact of this one element. So this one role of these prostitutes is literally plaguing everybody with STDs. We talked about the death of love. So you need to link STDs to plagues, um, you know, as a literal disease. But then plagues can also be metaphorical. We are condemning marriage. It's the death of love. It's the death of the sanctity of marriage because these women, are, if they ever got married, they'd be forced to cheat, obviously, because that would be their job to go out and sleep with other people for money. The breaking of the mother child bond, the breaking of the, the, the marriage bond, everything's falling apart. And the fact that the final word of the poem is her says it all about the atmosphere he wants to leave us on. He is saying that society is dead, society is dying, it's not doing its job. And he's made it very clear in stanza three who we should be blaming for that. Arguably also in stanza one, through the word chartered, he's, you know, expanding that to also blame the people who control the city and don't look after its inhabitants. Remember as an evaluative point that it would have been very difficult for the city to adapt to the huge numbers who were coming in the Industrial Revolution. Um, but that's a very, very kind approach to the poem uh, and to the way that people were treated at the time. It was a very forgiving a way of looking at it many people would not do that um okay so you know here we've got it very clear what destroys familiar relationships so you might return to afternoons now and ask well what's destroying the relationships there in terms of the wedding album lying near the tv the, the man the men standing behind the women you know what's causing the disruption and breakdown of the relationships there and is that again is that something that's more that's easier to come to terms with 
And I do think that at this point in the poem, especially, um, argue with me if you want, but I do feel like by the time you get to the end of this poem, you do feel like, well, there are worse things in the world than an estate full of washing. Um, you know, it kind of makes the women's lives and afternoons seem relatively okay. And actually, but is, you know, take that a step further. Is that how we should look at things? You know, oh, well, at least I'm not that person. Does that make us grateful or does that make us settle for things when we could ask for more? And, you know, it's a kind of like a glass half empty, glass half full situation. And you can decide for yourself, you know, which which you think is the best way to look at it. Um, and hopefully there are further ideas that can be generated there from that. Oh, exactly one hour. Right. I know there's a lot to consider, so I am leaving it here. Um, tomorrow, I'm not going to add any more onto our analysis. I am going, so I'm not going to do any other themes tomorrow's lesson. I'm going to give you a chance to digest and consolidate it. So um, I'll set you over the quiz and, and maybe like a comparison table. So see, show my homework for tomorrow for the details of that. And then I'll be back on Wednesday to do this again and have a look at the other themes for London. Okay, have a nice day if you can. Um, and I hope you're all keeping well. Bye.